All right, hi, my name is Anna Hasandova. I work for Diamond Stream, as Matt said. Um, today I'll be talking about moving beyond CRM. So we're focused on marketing um, initiatives and I'm gonna talk about how we use CRM data as well as integrating additional data sources in order to um, market properly. So what I'll be talking about specifically is a little bit about Diamond Stream and an executive summary. I'll talk about marketing problems that we've solved in, solved in the past in the casino industry, um, give you a brief demo of one of our products. I'll also talk about the new digital marketing landscape. And finally, I'll, I'll talk about how to keep up in the new digital marketing age. So who is Diamond Stream? So Diamond Stream is a small, small company um, based out of San Francisco. We were founded in 2005 to offer products and services in the areas of business intelligence as well as marketing analytics consulting. We developed uh, applications for market share analysis for casinos so that they can see how they're doing in their market. And we've also implemented data warehouse and BI applications for casinos and clients in the e-commerce space. And our current focus is, is really integrating this traditional BI um, data with, with more digital. So quickly, an executive summary. So until the late 90s, CRM really drove most of uh, marketing initiatives. And this, allowed, this allow, allows companies to get uh, recency, frequency, and monetary value metrics on, on their uh, customers. And this allows co uh, companies to actually segment people properly and, and be able to market to them. So in the 90s, actually, Caesars um, really pioneered this scene in the, in the casino industry with their uh, loyalty database. However, today, much of the customer activity is generated online. And so you really need to get that, integrate all of that data together in order to get a 360 degree view of your customers so that you really know what are they doing, what are they doing online, what are they doing offline, and uh, really be able to, to target the right ads to them. So you don't want to bombard people, but you want to be able to market to them uh, in an intelligent way. And for that, my argument is that you really need a digital data warehouse because you need to perform, be able to perform analytics, you need to be able to store all of this data, um, and it needs to be done in, in an easy uh, and accessible way. So a little bit about what we've done in the gaming industry. Um, and before I actually jump into that, I like to think of, of data in, in four stages of the data life cycle. Um, and it starts with the first stage, which is you generate and collect information, and then you move to the second stage, which is you standardize, cleanse this information, and you have to store it somewhere. And then you take that normalized and pretty information, you do analytics on it, and then finally, whatever insights you, you got from the analytics, you're able to act upon it. And so in the casino industry, um, we really set out to get this 360 degree view of, of clients, um, of patrons or gamers. So casinos, obviously, they can see what's happening inside of their casinos, but as soon as somebody steps out of the casino, they really don't have insight into what, what they're doing. So you can have customers who, who game um, $1,000 here, and then they go across the street to a competitor, and all of a sudden they're playing you know, $10,000. And so you really don't have that information if you only consider their activity inside of your casino. And we've actually done analyses that show that the more valuable a player is, so the more they game, the actually the less loyal they are. So it's more likely that if they're a high roller, they're more likely to go to many casinos. So it's really important to get their, their full view of their activity. And so how we achieved this was actually by looking at payments data. So inside of casinos, you have ATMs, you have credit card cash advances, you have all these methods for withdrawing cash. And so we decided to look at that data to see what are they doing across different casinos. And we integrated that with the casino CRM data for some clients. And ultimately, we developed an application that allows casinos to see their, their market share, which is in a given market, what percentage of the money is actually coming to the casino versus being spent somewhere else. Patron share, which is of the gamers in that market, how many are actually coming to the client casino. And finally, wallet share, which is of the people who actually come to my casino in that market, how much of their money am I actually withdrawing? Are they really high rollers somewhere else, but smaller with me? Or are they fairly loyal to my casino? And getting this 360 degree view enables casinos then to market appropriately. And using the RFM model um, enables them to do that. So going back to the four stages of, of the data life cycle, 
how we tackled this 300 degree uh, view is we gather data across the diff different casinos. Um, we partnered with a financial service provider uh, based out in, in Las Vegas, and they have about 70% market share in the casino industry in the US. So we have visibility into um, how much people are withdrawing cash inside of about 70% of the casinos in the US. So we can really see how much um, people take out cash in, in a lot of the casinos in the US. And we've, we've done analyses that show that it's very highly correlated to what people are actually gaining. So if you're withdrawing cash from the casino, you're most likely going to actually spend it there. And ultimately, this gives us information on over 12 million gamers across the world. And these gamers make more than 120 million transactions per year. And we have visibility into what's happening inside of more than 1,000 casinos. So it's a pretty large data set. And of course, going to the second stage of the data life cycle, we need to be able to cleanse that data and we need to be able to store that data. And of course, that came with quite a few challenges. And the first challenge we faced was the fact that we're just a very small team, as you saw. So we didn't have an IT department. We don't have DBAs. Um, so we needed to be able to leverage other third-party tools in order to, to store this data and create our data warehouse somewhere else. And so for that, of course, we chose a cloud-based infrastructure. For, for, for us, we chose um, Amazon Web Services. So, ah, pointer. So as you can see, actually, all of this is actually inside of Amazon Web Services. Um, another problem we faced was regarding patron matching. So we get our data from our payments uh, information. So if somebody goes into one casino and they withdraw using one credit card, and then they go to another casino at another point in time, and they withdraw using another credit card, a lot of times those two transactions don't relate back to the same patron ID. And so you need to be able to uh, accurately identify those transactions to that same record so that you were really able to understand how much are they actually gaming. And so we implemented a master data management solution also inside of, inside of Amazon Web Services that enables us to do that. It also enables us to, to integrate multiple sources. So if a casino wants to integrate their CRM data into this payments data, they can easily do that. And the matching happens inside of this master data management tool. Another thing we faced was the fact that just our data is vast in size. Our database is over one terabyte in its size, so we needed a database that is able to store that data um, and will let us um, perform analytics on it quickly and easily. And so we chose a columnar store database, Redshift, which is right here. It's also, um, it's an Amazon Web Services product, and so it's, it's also inside of that same cloud architecture um, and some of the benefits of it is that it actually compresses your data size, which is really cool. So instead of storing a terabyte of data, our size has been reduced significantly. It also allows for faster, uh, for faster analytics just because of how the data is stored. And finally, of course, we need to be able to build dashboards and reports. We need to show the casinos what's happening, what's happening inside of their casino. Also, how are they doing against their competitors? And so we chose a BI platform called Burst. And, oh, and it sits right there on top of Redshift, and it talks to Redshift. So actually, all of our ETL that we do is actually done inside of Burst. We don't actually write SQL codes in Redshift. We use this Burst, uh, Burst, the Burst platform to do all of that. And right here, I, we also do NCOA, which is National Change of Address. We cleanse up our data and kind of append the latest address, standardize the address formats, as well as include additional pens so that we actually get very accurate patron information. And this allows us to do analytics and, and you know, help casinos to take action on their data, which is the third and fourth uh, stages of the data life cycle. And for that, I'm actually going to show you a quick demo of our product. Let's see. OK, and for the sake of this demo, we're actually going to pretend like we're a casino based or a Las Vegas based casino. And uh, I, subscribe, I subscribe to this application that we've developed based on the payments data. So everything that you see here is actually payments data. But again, as I said, that correlates strongly with actual gaming data. So this is a really good predictor of what's actually happening. Um, and, for the sake of, and for the sake of the demo, I'm actually also going to pretend like I'm Bellagio 
because it's one of my favorite casinos. So if I'm Bellagio, and let's say in the last few months, I've been seeing that my revenues have been decreasing. And I really want to understand what's happening in the market. Um, who are the people who are driving my revenues to decrease? Is it just the market overall that's decreasing? Is it just me that's not doing as well? And then once I understand that, I can see who are the people who are actually driving this change. And I want to be able to market to them, to send them offers so that they come back to my casino. So the first thing we did actually before we even developed this application was we thought, well, you need to define the, the competitor set. So if I'm a Las Vegas-based casino, uh, if I'm Bellagio, I want to compare myself to my peers, so people who are of similar quality and who are also in the, in the same location as I am. So we based, uh, we created, developed an algorithm that classifies each casino in, in Las Vegas into 14 different peer groups. And these peer groups, as you can see here, are based on where they're located. So if I'm on the strip, I compare myself to strip casinos off the strip or neighboring areas around Las Vegas and also by the quality, because if I'm Bellagio, I probably don't want to compare myself to Circus Circus. They're just completely different clienteles. And so the first thing I look at is, okay, so let me look at a grand view of things. Let me look at the market share. Let me see across the United States, how many people who withdraw cash inside of Las Vegas, what percentage of their cash is actually withdrawn at my casino? And let's look at Washington State. So Washington State has 18%, which means that they actually kind of like my casino. And in the last year, these folks oh, withdrew more than $7 million um, just in Las Vegas. So they're very high revenue, um, and I also have pretty good market share with them. Let me see what's happening with these folks. Uh, I can see this on a Zip3 level. And I can also see what else are they doing inside of Vegas. So they spend 50% of their dollars actually in other street elite casinos or mine. And, but they also go to high-end strip casinos and mid-tier strip casinos. And also I can see what is my opportunity. So the people who live in Washington State, only 142 actually come to my property, but there's so many more that have not been to my property that I could really try to get, win back. And what is my dollar opportunity? So I can actually, my dollar opportunity is over $6 million. So let me zoom in a little bit more and see, okay, so we have Washington State state folks, I'm really interested to see what's happening with them. Let me see how I'm doing versus my competitors. And this chart gives you also a view of how you're doing versus your competitors, but let's take a look here on the right hand side and we see that over time, here's how much money they've been withdrawing and here are the top competitors they've been, that they have been also withdrawing cash from. And I can see that it actually has stayed pretty stable. This little blue guy is a little bigger, but it's actually been relatively stable. So let me zoom in a little bit more even to the property level and see people who come to my property, what are these folks doing? And I can see that people who come to my property tend to game in my casino. But look at this blue thing right here. It seems like recently in the last few months, they've been going to some other peer group. So they haven't even been gaming inside of elite casinos. They've been gaming at other types of casinos. So I'm really curious about what's happening there. Maybe this is what's driving my market share down. Oh. Let's see. So let me take a look here and I can see that strip elite casinos, that's 80% of, so they do come to strip elite casinos quite often, but look at this also. They come to high-end strip casinos. So maybe this is where the people who also game at high-end strip casinos, maybe they've been deferring from my casino and going to some other high-end strip casinos. So if we click here and take a look at what's happening here, I can see here at the bottom that with folks who, game to my, who come to my casino, a lot of them have been going to this other segment. So a lot of them have been going to strip high-end casinos because I can see that my wallet share with these folks has been decreasing. So a year ago, June, I was at 80% almost. And the year now, this year in June, I'm at 40%. Oh, yes. They're gambling based on which ATM machine they're withdrawing their money from? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, so let's see who these folks are that are, are going to this other casino and why am I losing so much share with them? So over here, I can actually see on an individual patron level, once it loads in a second, uh, exactly how much they withdrew in the last year in Las Vegas. 
And also, what percentage of that has been at my casino? And the dots and the, color, the colors and the dots actually represent how long ago was their last withdrawal with my property. So I can see that there's these three very interesting people who are withdrawing quite a bit of cash, but they haven't been to my casino in a long time. So let me zoom in on them and see what has their activity been in the last little bit. And over here I can see that their activity has been increasing in other peer groups. So it looks like they are going more into this other segment of um, strip high-end casinos because you can see the increase in the blue dots here. So this is very interesting. These, these people are actually um, leaving my casino, it seems, and they're actually tending to go to these uh, strip high-end casinos. And finally, so now that I've zoomed in on a segment, I can actually get a list of them individually. I can start calling them up and seeing, hey, what's going on? You know, why are you leaving my casino? I can send them an offer and try to get them back to my casino um, and things like that. And this application lets you do that. So you go from the high level, something's going on in my market, to the individual level and say, here are the people that I really need to try to win back. All right, so that's, that's what we've done in the casino industry to date. A little bit about where we're heading to, which is the digital marketing landscape. So as I mentioned, so much data is generated online now that most of your marketing efforts really do need to include this. And the digital world is very, very complex. So you're no longer thinking about, oh, people are coming to this casino or that casino. There's just so many things that are happening. And if we think back to the four stages of the data life cycle, each four of those stages has changed drastically. So with the data generation, you have 15 times more data generated than you did last year or 10 years ago. And this is due to the fact that there's just more channels available through which to generate data. You have your mobile phones, you have your tablets, you have your computers, and you also have better technology for tracking. You can attach uh, pixels to the pages, to the HTML code. You can attach cookies to your browser. You can get a geolocation on people, especially on mobile devices. So there's just so much better tracking, um, but also so much, so much more data. And this actually creates a lot of architectural problems. And the reason for that is because you just have new data types. Um, the data that you generate for mobile is very different from what you generated in CRM. And you really need to be able to integrate all of that data um, across all the different channels in order to get a very good view of what customers are doing. And the reason I say that is actually, I, um, I heard of a study by Forrester, and they actually saw that 22% of people who are buying are actually using multiple channels simultaneously. So if you're trying to buy something, you're most likely looking up on your phone, you're also looking up on your computer, you might be using your tablet at the same time before you actually buy something. And so in order for me to understand patron behavior and what drives them to buy something, I really need to understand their pattern across all of these different devices. Um, and all these different devices actually have different formats. So the data that you collect online from a website is very different from the data that you collect from a mobile device. And then ultimately, you just have so much data that you collect online. I mean, if you think about every little click that happens online, all of that data gets recorded. And so there's all these technologies that attempt to, to resolve all these problems. But really, having all these different tools also makes analysis a lot more difficult. And the reason for that is if you have a lot of pieces of technology, you need connectors to be able to connect one piece to the next piece. And that creates delays. And you also have so much more overhead maintenance because if something changes in the schema of one technology, you need to make sure that that propagates properly across all the different technologies. You need to be able to maintain the systems and upgrades. And then you also need to develop some sort of workflow tool that automates um, the flow of data across the different technologies as well as sends you alert if something goes wrong. And all these delays in the analysis actually delays your ability to take action. And the inability to take action at the right time can really come at the expense of your ROI. So um, you really need to be able to take action at the right time because you want to provide a personalized experience for your customers. Um, and so it can be different across different industries, but one study that I read was from Ancestry.com where they saw that people who abandoned a shopping cart, if you retargeted them within one hour of their uh, abandonment, 
60% of them actually went back and bought the shopping cart. But if you retargeted them after an, an, a day, then all of a sudden that percent went down from 60 to 5%. So the ability to, to take action quickly on the information that is provided to you can be super, super important. So now that I laid out all of these challenges, how do you actually go about you know, keeping up with all of this? So one thing, again, going back to the four stages, stages of the data life cycle, um, is that you have all these technologies that are out there. And it's so hard to keep track of who's doing what. And it gets really overwhelming, at least to me. And so I think breaking down your data problems into these four stages will really help you understand what technologies do you really need. If you have issue with the data collection and generation, then think of the technologies that can help you do that. Implement that technology so that it collects the data accurately and in as much standard form as possible. Um, and from the list of vendors that actually do data uh, collection and generation, you can then choose um, a, a technology that works for you. And more, more specifically for all four stages of the data life cycle, um, for data generation, try to use as many standard platforms as you can. So you have, um, if, you're, if you're adding pixels to your pages, it's good to use a tag management tool so that you can all keep track of all of that information on one page or in one location. Um, you know, you have all these data, data management and customer relationship management platforms that really enable you to keep all of your information in one location. And avoid manual data entry input as much as possible. And it sounds a little, I guess, silly, especially in the digital world, but it actually happens quite often. We had a client in the e-commerce business that, that bought out um, eight different websites. And so each of the eight websites was generating data. And each of the eight websites also had their own mini database. And so if an analyst wanted to create one report, they actually had to go into each of the eight different systems, create a query to pull the data, aggregate that information outside of the system in Excel, and then they were able to create their reports. And so that really um, created inaccurate reports because different employees had different skill levels with SQL. And so some people pulled one query in this way, another uh, employee pulled it in that way. So it created a lot of inconsistencies. And it also just took a lot of time. So by the time you're done with all of this query pulling and uh, combination, it might be that the report, the data that you have on the report is, is irrelevant. And so we actually implemented uh, a BI platform for them that integrated all of this data and that was updated uh, once a day. And so that enabled them to significantly you know, improve improve their ability to uh, pull reports and act on them. And so for all of these things, really the core is having a good infrastructure, uh, a data warehouse. And so you have so many different options. You can choose to be in the cloud, you can choose to be on premise. If you're in the cloud, you can choose to be in a VPC or a shared cloud. You also have other cloud-based solutions. So if you're thinking of uh, BI, platform, you can think of um, an integrated stack, which is kind of the ETL piece and the dashboard piece all in one tool, or you can think of buying two separate ones, which is just the ETL part or just the dashboarding tool. You also have different database options. So you can choose uh, between Columnar and Rowstore, um, Columnar like Redshift or Infobrite, and Rowstore like SQL or Oracle. And each one of those also comes with different options, which is how many nodes do you actually need in order to be able to process the data? Do you have multi-threading capabilities? Can people access the database at the same time? Um, and also whether you can pull data in and out and by streaming. And these options only continue to grow. You have more data, big data analytics and uh, processing tools, such as MapReduce and Hadoop, NoSQL, and other real-time analysis tools. And then you also have additional cleansing tools like the master data management. And finally, for all of that, you actually need a workflow tool that helps you manage all of these different pieces. Um, and like I mentioned, sends, a, sends you uh, error messages in case something goes wrong. So how do you go choosing from that? So I can tell you how with DiamondStream we went about choosing it. Um, we chose the cloud-based VPC architecture for everything. And like I mentioned, it was mostly because of the skill set that we had in-house. We didn't have an IT department. We didn't have DBA skills. So we wanted to be able to leverage other third-party tools that are in the cloud and not keep any of the hardware in-house. In we also chose the VPC, the Virtual Private Cloud, um, 
because it allowed us for more custom configurations. So if we have a section of our database that we want to keep completely private from the outside world, we can put it in one subset of that cloud. If we wanted to have another piece that is available to all users, we have that as an, in a separate sub, subsection of the cloud. And that enables us to, one, have better security because one piece is completely secure versus another piece that's more open to the users. And also, it's, it's just more custom. It also saved us a lot on costs. So we did some analyses that determined the cost. And these are the cloud costs right here. And then this is the appliance cost or the on-premise solution. So it definitely reduced the cost for us. We also chose the integrated stack platform instead of the best of breed. So instead of having a separate ETL tool and a separate dashboard tool, we chose one. Um, and it was also chosen because we didn't have that many ETLs skills, so we wanted to choose something that was relatively simple for us to use and also didn't require us to integrate those two pieces of systems because that requires uh, more maintenance. We also chose a uh, column store database because, I'm, as I mentioned, our data set in size is over one terabyte. And I think that's usually about the cutoff. If you're over one terabyte of data, um, it's usually recommended to use a columnar store, but it also depends on your use case. So um, columnar store is great because it actually creates size compression. So if our database was one terabyte before, using columnar store is actually smaller in size. It also enables us to perform analytics quickly. So if we need to sum across certain records, it enables us to do that quickly. On the other hand, there are certain calculations where they actually optimize or create um, approximations. So for example, count distinct in column store is not exact. It's very close to it, but it's actually an approximation or an, optimi an optimized calculation. Um, and then we also leverage other vendors. Uh, we chose just to use a masturbate data management tool just because it, we really needed to, to be able to match, dedupe, and cleanse our data, especially the patron information, especially if you're integrating multiple sources. And then we also have one workflow tool that's actually also inside of Amazon Web Services. Um, in order to manage all of these different pieces of the architecture. So now that we talked about the architecture, what about the analytics side? So it seems like there's so much more data, it's so different, the different sources, the different formats, but really at the end, the recency, frequency, and monetary value metrics are still key for segmenting. Um, and still use those, you're just trying to aggregate more information across more channels, but using RFM is still key. And you should use this to be able to segment folks properly. So that if you have somebody who visits a page frequently but actually doesn't buy something, that's one profile of user versus a user who doesn't visit a page frequently but actually buys something. So you have a window shopper versus an actual shopper. Um, and being able to segment those uh, folks based on intent allows you to market to each one separately and improve your ROI. Um, and then once you're able to, uh, to segment these folks, you can actually respond to each, each, uh, each of these people in a personalized way because then um, you're placing out the right ad rather than just overwhelming folks with ads of, that aren't really relevant. And this is kind of what you would end up with if you didn't actually market properly. <laughs> Um, so I think I'm actually pretty good on time. Um, if you have any questions, my email address, I think the presentation is probably available for download online, right? Is that, okay. Um, but if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me. Anybody, any questions? Yes. Yes. We use Burst. Uh, if we perform very complex analytics, um, we actually usually just export the data and, and do it either in SPSS or R, um, especially for predictive models in marketing. We've definitely used SPSS more. For performance reasons, yeah. I actually have a chart, I don't think I have it here, but we actually did a lot of tests on the performance and it, it really improved our dashboard, our dashboard times. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Um, we do use um, we we use Melissa data in the past. Um, who do we? I think we use we don't use Cast Online now. Um, we did append we did date of birth appends for example in order to determine the age of someone. Um, the address is really the main one that we use just because if if you're telling a casino here somebody to market to. We don't want their email piece or mail piece to bounce back, so that's really the main reason we use it. But we have done um, deceased depends and date of birth depends. We use a vendor. Uh, they're called Semerkey. It's actually a French company. So we we manage our uh, our patron information on there. Uh, we're able to then dedupe um, all of the, our patron files so that we actually, when we tie transactions back to user IDs, when we integrate all the user IDs to one record that's actually the right record, we then associate all of the transactions that were recorded against multiple IDs with that one ID. Um, the reason we use Semarkey is, um, first of all, price. <laughs> so for us, that was the most optimal solution. We are a small team. We're very cost sensitive. Um, and so we were able to, to get a, a, good, a good price with them because uh, master data management solutions can be quite pricey. Um, we also were able to implement that inside of Amazon Web Services, and that was one big thing. So the fact that we're able to implement that on RDS and have all of our infrastructure inside of Amazon Web Services, it just uh, makes life so much simpler because really a lot of delays happen when you're trying to move data in and out of the cloud that causes insane amounts of delay, and it also incurs cost. And so just keeping it all in one place was really a, a, big, a big reason for why we went that route. Exactly, that's exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. Was there a hand over here? I thought I saw one. Yes. So um, I can tell you that our data set is actually, so if you just go to a casino and you withdraw like $100 cash from the ATM, you won't get tracked. I mean, that transaction will get tracked. We won't know who you are. This is really for avid gamers who withdraw credit card cash advances. So after you've been to the cage and you withdraw a credit card cash advance where you have to fill out your information, that's where we actually know who you are. So ATMs, there's no way to know. I mean, I wouldn't use ATMs because of their exorbitant fees. That's a separate story altogether. Um, so it's, it's actually coming from the credit card cash advance. And then if you use that same card to make an ATM transaction, then we can link you back. Yes? So it sounds like you're moving in from kind of the gaming industry into more of an e-commerce, a wider uh, scale operation. Yes. I guess in some ways. Do you Um, that's a good question. I think the biggest thing is actually integrating across channels and, and being able to, to understand someone's activity across the different channels. And it's really about what is the path that they took to, to in order to convert. And yes, you don't have just high rollers and you focus on those. It's really about everybody. And so the data is just a lot more, um, is just a lot more grand. Um, in that sense, you don't discriminate against somebody versus another person. 
um, and not, you know, discriminating in quotes. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's mostly about the integration piece and being able to say, um, here's, here's your tag data, you know, here's your CRM data, combine that all together, get a really clear view, store that in a location that's easily accessible that you can actually use for analytics um, in a timely manner and then be able to market appropriately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So are you talking about like additional pens, like household incomes yeah. and things like that? We have considered that in the past, actually. Um, and you, obviously, you can buy this data. As scary as it is, you can buy a lot of data. Um, we haven't done it uh, just because the information that we have, especially in the casino with payments, has been very, you know, it's very good and it correlates with gaming much more than anything else that you can imagine. I mean, we, we did a lot of analytics and try to find relationships and this was really the thing that we could really use to predict. Uh, in terms of digital, it's a good question. We haven't, well, I guess we'll need to do more analytics to find that out. Yeah. Um, it, it has come up in the past, but we haven't, I think, the main core of even integrating the data sources that you have, I think, will give you so much even uh, more leverage that I think all this additional integration will probably come as a later piece. But it is something that we'll definitely consider and, and see how, how much value that adds. Yes? Uh, so I, I think I have two questions. First of all, going back to the ATM business. Yes. So have you ever looked at how much money, I mean, a casino may not know that I use my bank card to get an ATM transaction. They do. Well, they know, they get it down to my name, or only if that Oh, I, the ATM? Yeah. The ATM, no. Right. The ATM only records your credit card but also, number. But is it also, like, they know how many times that, how much money is being withdrawn each day, like how many times that's being filled right. every day, right? So have you, is that predictive of how much of their revenue, like, that ATM machine can't, um, so I think there's kind of two things there. So one is in terms of eight. Oh, oh yeah. So the question was, um, you have an ATM. So to me, I think there's actually two questions in there and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the first question is if you have an ATM that, uh, a lot of people would draw cash from, can you know that information or analyze yeah, that information? Right, right. And two is if somebody goes to one ATM, is that insightful or how often they withdraw cash? Not on the individual basis because it sounds like it's no, it's only if they... Uh, I mean, we know the credit card number. So if, yeah, if right. you use the same debit card yeah. for multiple transactions, all those transactions are gonna be associated with that same debit card. Right. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the, the uh, churn of the ATM, right? yeah. it's gotta be filled Mm -hmm. and, refilled and, refilled. and they have so many ATMs, like, so let's say they know how much money per day is being withdrawn from their ATM. Right. Is that correlated at all to the amount of gambling that goes on in their casino? Um, without, getting, without getting into the, down to the... To the individual level? level yeah. We have done macro analyses. And actually, credit card cash advance uh, correlates a lot more strongly than ATM transactions. So we have done analyses that says, uh, on this day, here's the ATM transactions. On that day, what's your revenue? And uh, credit card cash advance is correlated the most highly with that. So ATMs, and I can see that if you're, somebody's going clubbing or something, they also withdraw cash from the ATM. But they're probably not going to go get a credit card cash advance. Right, right. I hope that answered your yeah. question. So, so, so I guess yeah. I'm curious what you're learning in your master's program at Northwestern that is applicable to, to your work. Okay. So actually, I think predictive analytics as a title for that is, is very misleading. Okay. It actually is re really related to databases. So we learned specifically like how to design a data, a data warehouse. Uh, and we actually did a lot of exercises with SQL. Um, we learned a lot about, I guess, a little bit about the history and that kind of thing. So it's actually very related to what we're doing. I'm not sure, predictive analytics sounds like I'm 
building statistical models, but it actually isn't. Um, so it is kind of a misleading name, at least to me, I think it is misleading. So it is actually very related. Uh, any other questions? So not to target, so we've had uh, casino clients in the past that we've done more like consulting basis and we've done a lot of marketing predictions for them. So we developed a lot of models for them and say, okay, here's the optimal offer that you should send out and actually send out the piece of offer. But this, the application that I demonstrated is more just a tool for them to use. So they can subscribe to that and they pay monthly uh, and then they just go into the dashboard and they can see what's happening. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much.